right, so everybody um, here, I think, was here for the last uh, portion of our forum. So um, I'll just go over the, uh, the, the format really quickly. We are, um, because uh, I was given the opportunity to come up with the format myself, um, we are not going to have any opening statements. Um, you will have an opportunity at the end to give a one-minute closing statement. You can address anything that you weren't able to address or uh, sing a song or give your standard one-minute closing statement. It's up to you. Um, but we're going to start with a two-minute um, response uh, question and um, we're going to start over um, on stage right with John Grant. Um, and the first question is, um, the City Council has committed to uh, upholding, oh by the way, this is our Position 8 City Council Forum. Uh, the City Council is committed to upholding the Paris Accords. Um, with transportation as the single biggest contributor to carbon pollution in our region, achieving those goals is going to require the city to make some big sacrifices, um, and it could require drivers in particular to make sacrifices. What will you as a council member do to reduce Seattle's auto dependence and improve the climate impact of the city, of our transportation system? You'll have to show me how to turn this on. So push the button on the bottom for like two seconds and it should come on. Hello? Yes. Try holding it down just a little bit longer. Hi, hello? Testing. One, two, three. Try the other one. Hello? Testing. There we go. Just kidding. Um, uh, so the, I'm sorry, the, I was a little the question, that. so the question um, in short is, um, what will you do to reduce the impact of our transportation system on climate in Seattle? So um, I think that there's a, a lot of things that we need to do to address um, the uh, uh, cl climate crisis that our, our, our country is facing, and I think cities have a huge role in that. Um, part of my uh, campaign uh, platform is to actually have the city divest uh, from the fossil fuel industry from its using its uh, pension fund. But in respect to cars and automobiles specifically, um, I think that we need to really double down on transit-oriented development and also make sure that the funds from SD3 and New Seattle are being used to uh, build not just great uh, transit hubs, but also affordable transit hubs, where we're using the public land surrounding um, some of these new light rail stations to invest in uh, publicly owned affordable housing on top of it, so that we create affordable density, so that the communities that are um, least likely to have automobiles can actually work and live in the city. So I think um, that is one really important thing that we can do. Uh, another thing that we can do is really to uh, encourage road diets throughout the city. I know that I live in um, the Rainier Valley, and uh, for those of you that aren't familiar, you drive down Rainier Avenue South, and there are cars, like, literally careening through buildings left and right. And I think the more that we have uh, road diets to encourage folks to use public transportation and to um, it increase uh, pedestrian safety as well, these are things that we can do as a city to both densify, to create um, better environmental outcomes and also to reduce our carbon footprint. The next candidate is uh, Mac McGregor. Same question, what would you do to reduce Seattle's auto dependence and uh, improve our impact on climate? Well, I like collaborating. My idea with that is to collaborate with um, local corporations and businesses to get a buy-in to get more people to carpool and use other forms of transportation. Um, use an education program, use incentive programs to get them to encourage their employees to use other forms of transportation and carpool. Um, I think that it's also, I, I want a, a better um, park and ride um, areas for people to park around the transit areas and, and be able to use that to ride in. So that would be the solutions I would want to use. Next candidate uh, is Teresa Mosqueda. So good evening, my name is Teresa Mosqueda, running for Seattle City Council Position 8. Thank you so much for having us tonight. I'm excited to be here because my life's work has been in public health, fighting to make sure that those who live in this city can actually afford to stay here and work here and retire here. I've spent my life working in public health to create more walkable, bikeable neighborhoods. And when it comes to what's happening at the national level and Trump pulling out of the Paris Accords, that is exactly why I am running for city council, because cities now have to be the first line of offense. We are the last line of defense when it comes to protecting our residents 
and our environment and our local community. What I'd like to see is more transit-oriented development so people can afford to live in this city, more environmentally conscious development as well, so that we have more passive house opportunities, more cross-laminated timber, more development that actually thinks about the environment as we create density in our city. And lastly, we have to recognize that there's communities throughout our city who are dying at earlier rates because of their zip code and their race. Our communities in areas like Delridge are dying 13 years earlier than those who live in the suburbs of King County. And we can do more as the city to help get rid of diesel fuel transit. Make sure that we move to an electric grid and work in partnership with the port. We can electrify our transit system here in the city and work in partnership to make sure that drayage trucks no longer have the diesel um, kind of heavy trucks that are least expensive that, that our, many of our workers are being forced to purchase, we can create actual environmental opportunities right here in our own backyards that allow for folks to stay in the city that they work, to have more environmentally conscious areas that they live in and work, and make sure that we can also think about what the next generation needs. As we create more housing here, I want to see us create electric ports so that more people can plug in their electric vehicles, but I also want to see us expand out those um, urban villages so that we can actually create the density that we need right around the transit hubs that are being created now. Thank you. Heisen Gwaley. Heisen Gwaley, running for Seattle City Council position eight. When I think about transportation, in order to get people out of their cars, transport has to, transportation has to be reliable, it has to be efficient, and it has to be timely. In order to do that, you actually have to look at what is the density of each one of your neighborhoods. It turns out that in some of our neighborhoods, per acre, there are 12 single family homes which means related to transportation, that means transportative services every 30 minutes, which means no one is going to ride it. In order to improve transportation to those areas, you have to increase the amount of density. The way you do that is basically looking at different housing options. If you're able to increase the density by twofold, you're actually able to import transportation to 15 minutes. It turns out, behaviorally, when we stop looking at timetables and actually take transportation reliably, is at eight minutes. In order for us to reliably use transportation, to get out of our cars and use it as a main mode of transportation, it requires us to be at every eight minutes. So when I think about transportation and how we will improve transportation to our city and get people to stop using cars, it's going to really require us to invest in transportation in a significant way so that we can actually have people out of their cars and actually using it. In addition to that, when we're talking about what is the main polluter, actually is carbon gases, it turns out it's actually airplanes. And what we would need to do is work with the port and get them actually on biodiesels so that we can actually cut down carbon gases. Thank you. is Sarah Nelson. Hello, thank you for coming tonight. Mode shift, that is the, that's the key here. Getting people out of the cars means offering an alternative, and that means in investing in bike, ped, transit infrastructure. Con continuing to invest in transit hours by renewing our uh, Seattle component of the metro um, service hours, but also supporting the sound transit and making sure that our land use policies align with our transit-oriented development policies. It, that is easier said than done. It's easy to say that, but we don't mean just plunking a bunch of um, housing along a transit line. I was in Richard Conlon's office when we, were, we went through the years-long planning process to make sure that the Capitol Hill station was planned with community input and had amenities so that it would be a, an attractive place for people to live. So it's easier said than done to put housing along transit lines. You really do have to have buy-in from the community and work to make those spaces livable. Finally, charging stations and electrifying our lines and making sure that our streets and our, our bike uh, bikeways are safe. Another thing that we don't really think about is what are the alternatives to to, um, to cars, and that could be just, um, I'm, never mind, scratch that. I was just thinking, and, and, never mind. 
So it's mode shift, transit-oriented development, electrifying our areas, and also making sure that we are continuing to invest in the infrastructure for our long-term transit future. Our, our last candidate is Shalee Seacrest. Yes, Shalee Seacrest. How do we make sure that we reduce our carbon footprint and reduce our reliance on cars? I serve as leader of the NAACP, where my task as the chair of economic development is also to figure out how are we able to really make Seattle that livability, right? As a tagline, we always say, make Seattle a great place to work, live, and play. But what does that really mean, and how does that affect neighborhood when you're visioning what a neighborhood and community would look like? Well, if we can get people out of their cars, if we can make sure that in their community, they're able to have their needs met. They can work right there inside of their community. They don't have to have a long commute. We can make sure that there's movie theaters, the entertainment right there in their community. We can make sure that mothers and their children and their parents are able to go to parks and have nights at the park and movies at the park right there inside of their community. I have the pleasure of being able to serve as an attorney that creates the community benefits agreements for a lot of the project developments that's happening. Last week, we did the Liberty Bank there in the central area. Together, community sat at the table and we said, what is it that we wanna see? How is it that we want to live inside of our neighborhood where we don't have to run and drive across town in order to get our immediate needs met? I think Seattle could do a lot better. I live in the south end of Seattle, and right now, I like the model of Columbia City. I recall at the time of Arc Lodge Cinemas, and what type of parks, and how can we make sure that the restaurants and the jazz walks, it's a lively area. Those are the innovative ideas that happens when you actually bring community to the table. Unfortunately, Seattle city leaders, we've run into this barrier where we're not getting the dis those impacted, at the table to be able to lift up their voices of what they want. That's what I want to do for City Council. Thank you. All right, the next question, uh, we're going to start uh, with Mac McGregor, and we're going to do that all the way down the line, so it will be the next person first, next. Um, and this uh, is a one minute question. What does racial equity mean to you, and how does it impact your approach to land use and transportation? Okay, hi. Um, racial equity is, just like all forms of equity, is extremely important. And I live in the South End as well. There's three of us here that live in the South End. My son right now um, goes to Cleveland High School, and he is one of the only, there's two white kids in his class, in, in most of his classes. And so I, we are in a very diverse area, and I love that. Um, I think that the homes in our area and the racial equity in transportation, uh, many of the people that live in our area don't own cars or they have one car for their whole family. And so I think this is very important. We need to build and make sure there are transportation options open for people in these racially, especially more racially diverse areas to be able to get around and get to the services and get to work. So I think us understanding and looking at the racial equity lens with everything that we do and the way we design transportation and um, our, our neighborhoods is very important. Thank you. Again, Teresa Mosqueda. So racial equity and health equity is the lens that I apply all of the work that I do right now. When I think about what it looks like to have racial equity, it's what I started with. The communities throughout our city are not getting equitable investments. We say all the time to be healthy, go outside, eat right, go for a walk. But if our communities quite literally do not have sidewalks, street lamps, bikes, safe routes that they can get out, we're not creating opportunities for physical activity and social cohesion. Number one, I would want to make sure that we're investing in our communities that have the least right now and making sure that we're thinking about how the infrastructure goes into our communities who don't have sidewalks, don't have bike lanes, and are actually getting um, the short end of the stick. Second of all, when you think about who's the most transit reliant, it's communities who are the lowest income and communities of color who are getting pushed out of our communities. We gotta make sure that we can afford to keep folks here in our city and invest in them equitably. 
Secondly, as we think about the green energy economy, making sure that more people are getting an opportunity to go to school and invest in our new economy. That's why I'm calling for free college tuition right here in our city, like New York State. So as a doctor at Northwest Hospitals, I see patients that come in for clinic. And several of them are using the public transportation system and are of lower income and are required to use three buses to actually get to Northwest Hospitals. So when we talk about what would be equitable, we would say, who are the most vulnerable in our population? What access do they presently have to transportation services? And what can we do to support that group of individuals to use transportation in a reliable and safe way to meet their basic needs that all of us do in a city. When I think of racial equity, I think we have to be really coherent and really honest about how we're going to invest our money. And it's not going to be typically in wealthy neighborhoods. It is going to be in some of the most underserved areas. But by helping them, we lift the whole population. Thank you. Racial equity means equal access to public services, in my mind, and I will use the, uh, the Racing and Social Justice Toolkit, which is um, a set of protocols that uh, council and, and executive people use to, um, to screen and develop legislation to make sure that, the, that equity is built into whatever legislation comes forward. That means investing in service hours where it's most needed. That means making sure that uh, communities have all of these services they need. And so think about a food desert. So making sure that there are places where people have equal access, not just to transportation, but also to all the other um, things, parks, schools, and healthy food that make for a healthy community. Racial equity and what does it mean for land use and transportation? When I think of racial equity, it's show me the money. Where are you pouring that money? I'm from the CD. My parents graduated from Garfield High School. And I can tell you historically, in the Central District on 22nd and Yesler, you're talking about a community that had been historically disinvested by Seattle. On 23rd and Jackson, where the NAACP's office is, I recall we had been asking for sidewalks. There was not even a traffic light, and so a mother had a tragedy where she had her child, who was riding a bicycle, got killed right in front of our office. We were asking for traffic lights. It took for the area to become gentrified before we started seeing and even being able to be heard for our needs. So racial equity for me is making sure that you're pouring resources into neighborhoods and communities of color. Low income color, but you said racial, so that's what it means. Pouring resources, transportation, and land use to communities of color. I think that one of the biggest concerns that I have as the city grows is that, I mean, I live down in uh, southeast Seattle, and as the light rail stations uh, continue to gain more activity, prices and housing costs continue to boom in those areas. And I think that as the city continues to grow, we need to ask more from the private sector to make sure that the communities that are living there are not facing displacement. So one of the big things that I would like to see is for the city to adopt a uh, very large corporate tax increase so that we can have the revenue to actually buy land and hold it as public housing. Because if we can actually grow the public housing stock, it can be the city to be the, that can be the countervailing force to the market. Right now, the city is selling its public lands left and right. We lost 400 acres of public land when we sold uh, parcels off to, of Yesar Terrace to Vulcan. We uh, sold an entire city block of uh, city land to build multi-million dollar condos to try out capital. And it was the work that we did at the tenant union to stop that so that we could get more resources to build more affordable housing to stop displacement right. for the universal equity. All right. Uh, so, uh, you guys are really going to hate this, but the next question is 30 seconds. Oh, oh great. Um, and, uh, and the question is, um, you've been elected a city council member and you just found word that SDOT wants to put um, a, a major street on a road diet. 
And uh, that means, if you're not familiar, uh, taking out general purpose lanes and replacing them with bike lanes, transit lanes, and a center turn lane. Uh, proponents say the project will save lives. Opponents say it will contribute to congestion. Um, and SDOT is asking for your guidance. What do you tell them? I think one of the most important things we can do as advocates for public health and advocates for density is work with the community to get community buy-in. Sometimes there's objections to projects when we don't have community input and get feedback early. We need to do that then to move forward. And I would also say, we need to think about road diets throughout our community and talk about the public benefit back. When we get more people walking, biking, going to their local shops, thinking about ways that they can go in and interact, we can create social cohesion that is good for our mental health, that's good for our physical health, it's good for the local economy, and I want to see us have super blocks like they have in Barcelona. As a doctor, this is easy. You save lives. The reason that you save lives is that every life is important and every life deserves dignity. When we basically talk about like how do we actually build community, it involves us meeting each other and in places where we can actually commune. That only happens when we basically make the decision that we actually value public space over individual cars. I say bring it on. I've experienced two road diets, one on my, uh, in a neighborhood street on 50th, and it was it improved traffic, and another on Nickerson, and I have to say the sky did not fall. There was a lot of hemming and hawing, but um, traffic didn't get backed up. I was able to get in and out and cross the street and make turns much faster and easier in my car, and I felt better when my kids were with me walking across the street. It's safer, and I think that it's, uh, it's a method that we need to, uh, to continue to expand. And when people experience it, it's not that bad. If we can put a man on the moon, I'm sure we can figure out ways to share the road. I believe that it's not impossible for us to make sure that we actually get solutions on how do you make sure people can walk, bike, and drive to work. We can do it, it needs political will. We need to stop talking about how we're going to make the investments to it and actually get it done. For City Council, I want to make sure that we're implementing the recommendations that have already been laid. You all have been telling leaders what it takes to share the road. It's time we get it done. So again, I, I spoke about road diets before. Um, I got to say, huge fan. When I was in, uh, uh, you know, walking down the street, um, cars were going, you know, 25 miles an hour, and it was amazing. And we absolutely have to have community input on that process. But at the end of the day, road diets save lives. And I think that if we can, um, you know, uh, actually have a, a bicycle master plan that is fully funded and actually give people viable alternatives people will use them. If you build it, they will come, and the city just needs to hold, actually, you know, when they say they're gonna fund the Bicycle Master Plan, truly fund it, which we have not seen today. I say bring it on. I think our number one job, first, is safety, and this saves lives, so I say bring it on. The second thing that I think is very important is reducing our carbon footprint, and this also supports that, so I'm a big supporter. If you haven't pulled them out already, under your chair, uh, you should find a whiteboard. So pull that out, and we're going to do a lightning round of uh, a quick uh, yes, no, and short answer questions. Um, hold up your whiteboard as soon as you're done answering, and um, keep it up. Uh, first question, um, on your whiteboard, please write down these four categories of transportation users in order of priority. Drivers, pedestrians, cyclists, and transit riders. <coughs> Let's hope you have better, better handwriting than the last batch of candidates. <laughs> All right, uh, Shelly Seacrest says, um, number one, pedestrians, number two, transit, number three, drivers, number four, cyclists. Matt McGregor says, pedestrians, cyclists, transit, transit, drivers. John Grant says, cyclists, pedestrians, transit, and cars. 
uh, Teresa Mosqueda says transit, bikes, uh, little heart, uh, pedestrians <laughs> and drivers, and Hyson Quayley says transit, cycling, pedestrians, drivers, um, and Sarah Nelson says transit, pedestrians, cyclists, drivers. All right, so clear your whiteboards. And... <laughs> <laughs> All right, next question. Um, it's a trivia question. Oh, God. What percentage of commuters into downtown Seattle at rush hour get to get there by transit, and what percentage get there by driving alone? What percentage by, uh, of rush hour commuters into downtown Seattle get there by transit, and what percentage get there by driving alone? have the answer this time. I didn't have it for the last, uh, for the mayoral folks. But they were quicker than you guys are. All right, Hysum says 47% uh, and 47% uh, transit, 30% driving. And this is a plug for Seattle Road Podcast that actually has the answer. <laughs> Uh, Sarah Nelson says 47-32 uh, transit drivers. Shalee Seacrest, 30% drivers and 70% transit. Um, I can't read. There's a pie chart and the biggest part of the uh, Teresa Mosqueda, 45% transit, 45% uh, um, uh, and then the rest is a mystery. Uh, about 11% transit, 11% driving, and 30% cyclists. Um, so so anybody who wants to do that math, uh, go for it. Uh, Matt McGregor says 70% uh, drive alone and 30% transit. Um, John Grant says 60% alone and 40% transit. The actual answer is 47% uh, transit and 30% uh, drive alone, which uh, is what Tyson had. And, uh, and Sarah Nelson is also very close. All right, um, last uh, last. Short question for this round. Do you support making Fifth Avenue transit only during rush hour? Teresa Mosqueda says yes. John Grant says yes. Matt McGregor says yes. Hyson Bueli says yes. And Shalee Seacrest says yes. Right. Um, so uh, this is another um, two minute question. Um, and we're going to start with Hyson. What do you think about the direction the city has taken on mandatory housing affordability? Um, and do you think that the requirements in HALA are adequate to prevent displacement and provide housing for people at risk of being pushed out by wealthier residents? Okay. Hi, Zimbabwe, Seattle City Council, position eight. Um, I think HALA is a good start. I don't think that it is the end. I do think we could have asked developers for more housing. I think that we uh, could have pushed that percentage up a couple of more. What I would like to see us do from an affordable housing standpoint is I think that we in Seattle have to build the housing for the most vulnerable in our city. When we're talking about extremely low and very low and affordable individuals, uh, the way that the city would do that is by taking its surplus property and developing what's called a PDA. A PDA would be very similar to capital housing or the Pike Place market. And what it allows us to do is the following. It allows us to have governmental oversight, yet have public interest. It allows us to apply for federal HUD grants and basically pull more money from the federal government. The third thing that it allows us to do is actually uh, uh, ask for donations that are considered tax deductible because it would be then charitable. We then actually use that, the, that land to basically uh, bond against it. That bonding capacity that we would have then developed, we're able to buy housing and build on our land. The other thing that the city could do to build more affordable units is develop private-public partnerships along the arterials. It could rezone some of our neighborhoods that are industrial for affordable housing, which are actually by bus lines and by transit hubs. So the things that I think we should be doing as far as building more affordable housing uh, is developing a PDA, uh, and then developing transit, uh, our public-private partnerships. Additionally, the one thing that HALA did not do well is it talks about livability only twice, once in the title and once in the 65 recommendations. What I would recommend us do is actually develop a commission where we ask developers for community benefits. As 
As an environmentalist, I support HALA and the uh, mandatory housing set-asides set because we need to focus growth where it most matters. This region is changing and we have to be smart about where we, we, we direct growth. The HALA process was months long and was the result of a, of a broad coalition and uh, the, the numbers that came out, I, I feel that I don't have the uh, the expertise to quibble about the about the percentages, but I think that the the method about um, determining, you know, if it's nine percent or if it's ten percent, I think that I will support what came out of that coalition. However, I do have some concerns about its impact on low rise. I feel I've heard from some low rise developers that um, that it will hurt the lowest cost housing model and that it will um, then you know uh, decrease the amount of affordable units that we can that we have. And so it could also be that some neighborhoods need to have different numbers. But in general, I do support the process and I do support that this is the way that we're going to get to affordable housing. I think that what we need to also focus on is retaining already existing affordable housing. There is a lot that we could do to, uh, to support small landlords so that they do not sell their units and get them redeveloped into, into in, you know, high rises. There is a bill in Olympia that we almost got passed that would have put 6,000 units of already existing affordable housing on the market. And there is a program that would provide seniors with um, a, 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 a property tax credit or that would allow them to stay in their homes and that would make their existing housing more affordable. There are things that we can do with our existing units and I believe that we're on a path with this process and we will have to see how it plays out. You know, we don't really know um, what will be the impact of these, um, you know, once these up zones are, are put into place and we have to also be flexible to see what will, what will happen in a few years. Some of the things I like and dislike about the HALA recommendations, I like ban the box recommendation to the housing application. Currently, NAACP, I enforce the labor laws for the city, and we do ban the box. You can't ask about criminal history on your employment application until a certain time. Let's make sure we do that for housing applicants. We know that there's folks who need second chances who are being denied housing because of their criminal history. Let's stop that. MFTE to nonprofit organizations. Right now, under the payor option, money goes to the Office of Housing under this multifamily tax exemption. It gives incentives for development to be able to have affordable, affordable housing. In the central area, where I serve as the Central Area Collaborative and BCIA member, we actually have six projects in the central area that's going to have housing available for those making less than 19,000 a year. That works. I also like the enforcement of discrimination um, laws. They had raised the issue that folks at 60% are being discriminated against because of their race, religion, sexuality. We need to make sure that we are putting sources into actually enforcing the law. Pat Lolly says we need to enforce what's already there. Some of the dislikes I have about HALA. Urban villages, I'm afraid of economic segregation. What does that look like? As we are saying that the money is going to go into this OH housing supply, where does that go and what, what does that mean? I'm afraid of that. Segregation has not worked very well in my community. I don't want that again. Grand bargain, it wasn't very grand. I don't like the fact that we weren't able to continue our discussion of how do you adjust the single family zoning? How can we get triplexes into single family zoning? Is that an option? We shut, that, we shut that door too early. I want to see us get back at the table and see how can we make that work. Engagement sucked. Oh, I was shorthand. Engagement was not the best. <laughs> we could have done a lot better on the HALA engagement. Thank you very much. So we're talking about MHA and the grand bargain at HALA. No complaints. Just kidding. Um, so I, I think that one of the big things that you're gonna hear from folks, and I think that there's wide agreement, is that there's lots of different alternatives to address affordable housing. There's tax credits, community land trusts, there's public housing. Those are all good things, but it's all the public addressing the problem. We really need to get to how can the private sector address the problem. And that's why I think the mandatory housing affordability standard is so important. 
It is the city's tool to have the private sector address our affordable housing crisis. And in downtown and South Lake Union, the affordability requirement was as low as 2% of each building to be affordable. 2%. The highest goes to 9% in the university district. And I think land use is how you really determine if a city council member is progressive or not. Because if you look at the vote for the university district up zone, they proposed to increase that affordability mandate by 1%. That lost on a 6 to 3 vote. Now that tells you something. We need more folks that are going to be on the city council to be champions, to hold developers accountable and make them pay their fair share. I've put forward a proposal that, will, that would require developers to have 25% of their buildings to be affordable. Now right now, Hala has limited uh, building heights to just one additional floor in some parts of the city. That greatly constrains the ability of developers to meet a 25% affordability threshold, and we also lose thousands of units of affordable housing. I think that it is totally reasonable for us to seek um, greater affordability for developers. San Francisco actually set it at 25%. There was a commission formed and they reduced it to 18%. Well, we're at 2% and we're trying to get higher. I would have much rather started at 25% and negotiated down, but that's not the deal that we got. We must demand more. So I think there are some pros and cons to HALA. Um, one of the things is that I think um, HALA has great collaboration with some of our nonprofits and, and billionaires, and, and that was good. Um, one of the concerns about that collaboration, though, there's a group, Open Phil, um, who seems to be wanting to control our land use and send the um, decisions about land use to a state level and take it away from the city which I'm very concerned about. Um, I think the, um, the upzoning around sound, sound transit is an important issue we need to look at. And I agree with John that the one floor, I went to a meeting with developers, because that's not my area of expertise, trying to learn about the obstacles they face. And they all talked about that one floor upzone um, limits what they can do. And it prices them basically out of um, supplying more affordable housing. So I think that's an important thing to look at. We also need to look at 65% of our land is zoned single family, and we have to change that um, with the, the way the city is growing. So I think that's an important thing for us to look at. Um, the grand bargain, I think we need to require more. We just aren't asking enough. I agree that um, we need to be bold and, and just require more from these developers. 20,000 units is what the grand bargain says over the next 10 years. Look at the rate our city's growing, that's not enough. So we have to um, demand more from them, including impact fees to help the livability um, situation. Um, Challenge Seattle is a great thing to look at. I've been um, studying a lot of that, and that was a collaboration with the UW and many corporations in our area that Christine Gregoire um, helped facilitate, and it had to do around transportation and affordable housing, and they have some really amazing ideas about how, for us, how we can move through the future. So, uh, again, Teresa Mosqueda, I stand here saying we see the cranes throughout our city now, development is happening now, and I want each one of the opportunities that we see with underneath Holland to get the housing that we need now. There is not time to waste. Every day I go north knocking on doors, and seniors, communities, those in the missing middle are telling me that they're getting priced out of this area. So let's move forward with the Hall of Recommendations. Not call for things that are going to grind us to a halt, bring us back to the table. I want to see us move forward, but also recognize Hala alone is not enough. That's why I'm calling for us to rezone the single family area. Make sure that we can have ad dudes, dad dudes, duplexes, triplexes. Think of creative ways so that folks like me who rent right now, me and my husband-to-be, we want to own one day, but we need the density in our city now so that we have more affordable options. I also actually sit on a public development authority board. I sit on the old PacMed tower over there, and we are actually turning our land in the north lot into affordable housing with childcare facilities on the fourth floor, with a healthcare facility, with a place for seniors to go so they can afford to live and age in place. That's what development done right looks like. That's why I'm calling for an immediate conveyance of all developable land in our city 
that our county owns, that our city owns, that Sound Transit owns, that our state owns, that could be used for affordable housing to be moved into affordable housing now so we create the housing we need and the density in our city. And I'm also saying we gotta do something about the speculation in the market because there are wealthy investors sitting on empty land that could be turned into the housing that we need now. It's time that we assess that issue within our community. And lastly, I'll say this. We need to look at what it means to create the housing that we need. I talked earlier about making sure that the development includes energy efficiency, the plug-ins for uh, electric vehicles, also solar panels. But I'm also calling for two bedrooms and three bedrooms so that we can have more families live in the city and that more immigrant families who live with larger families can think about staying here so that those who stock our grocery shelves, those who teach our kiddos, and those who write the code in our city can all afford to live here. Thank you. Um, so uh, the next question is a one minute response. Um, city council um, and the city has adopted a goal of zero pedestrian deaths and, uh, and serious injuries by 2030. Um, and yet in the past several years, uh, there have been, uh, the, the numbers have actually gone up or remained steady. Um, so as an at-large city council member, what would you do to provide safe places for people to walk in Seattle and how will you prioritize which projects get funded? Well, I would use racial equity as a lens to figure out which which projects get funded and to look about where look to where those projects are. I would accelerate the projects um, in the priority projects in the, in the bike and peg master plan. And I would uh, everybody says sidewalks, but uh, sidewalks are expensive because putting in the drainage part is the is the expensive part. So if we could do a lot more natural drainage systems, that would um, that would give a soft edge to streets. It would also um, it would also take care of some of the, the, the surface water runoff that is is clogging up our um, our rainwater runoff system. So we need to think of creative ways of, of making our streets safe that don't necessarily require sidewalks. We could also explore different ways, different um, street crossing methods. I was um, working on pedestrian summer with Richard Conlon, and there is research that says that mid-block crossings are actually safer for pedestrians. We need to think about what we, um, what is actually safer for pedestrians. If pedestrians are not crossing at the corners where, they, where cars are turning, then that is possibly safer, and I would restrict uh, right on red. I believe in finding solutions from the ground up. I had the honor of having breakfast with Andres Solomon, I don't see him, um, but he knew the map of the city like the back of his hand. Every street corner, every sidewalk that needed um, bike lanes, I mean, you name it, he had it right there. And I was asking, I said, why isn't the city listening to you to figure out how do we make sure that it's safe? I, had, I would suggest, we actually do a better job of partnering with the community-based organizations, Cascade Bicycling Club, right? You guys know what's out there and how we're able to make sure we reach that 0% pedestrian deaths before 2030. We need to do the low-hanging fruit. On Rainier Avenue, community activists got together and they put in their own sticks, right? The roads weren't safe on Rainier Avenue. It was white sticks. They said, you know what? We're not going to wait for you all day, Scott Hubley. We're going to do it ourselves. Those are the types of leadership from the community that we need to employ on City Council. Well, I think um, one of the big obstacles of having safer streets um, and sidewalks and just having a, a lack of resources is the fact that we, we're one of the few cities in the Puget Sound area that, that does not have impact fees. And if you look at the, the, the booms and the growth that's happened since the 90s, we've probably left you know, hundreds of millions of dollars on the table that we could be using to improve sidewalks, grading, uh, bike trails, and also, uh, you know, building schools that are at our over capacity. So one of the things that I would really like to do is that, you know, not just use the existing pie of resources that we have to address all of our community's needs, but to grow that pie. And I think by having the private sector pay their fair share of three impact fees, we could address a lot of the things that I hear about from folks at the north end, that there's not enough sidewalks, and folks that I hear about in my own community in the south end, that, you know, driving uh, riding your bike on Rainier Avenue South, like you're, <laughs> it's a harrowing experience, they don't recommend it. 
anyways, we, those, we need to get the resources in the bank and then we can start building out that infrastructure. So I was walking with a friend um, who I took to the hospital um, to get her knee checked on because she just had knee surgery. And we were by Swedish and the sidewalk was so um, crazy that she couldn't even navigate it and we had to walk in the street, on the side of the street. So this shouldn't happen. That's a huge safety issue. Um, I, also, I also agree with John that we need to um, be charging these developers impact fees because right now with all the levies on homeowners, they have been taking all the brunt of this and that is not fair. So impact fees are very important. I think that safety, as I said before, is one of the most important issues we have as city council members and I think this is imperative and we need to work on making sure that crosswalks, bike lanes are safe. And we need, it's different in each neighborhood, so we need to get the neighborhoods to be a part of these solutions. So I look at the investments around Seattle again, and one of the, mo the biggest priorities that I'll bring to city council is looking at it through a racial and social justice lens. One of the first things that I would do is make sure that we're actually investing in those areas that have the least in infrastructure investments, looking at the areas that have higher rates of asthma, making sure that we're connecting sidewalks in underserved communities. So we're creating opportunities for people to get out, the public infrastructure that makes it possible for people to get out of their cars and start walking. I'd like to see us make sure that we connect the grids, both sidewalks and bike lanes, to make sure that more people can get to their senior center, can get to their kiddos' school, or can get to their office themselves. I'd like to look at, have us look at more permanent street vacations, taking away some of the parking that's in our city to create the opportunity, again, for social cohesion. I look at the area over by Horizon House that turned a few parking lots or few parking spaces into a place where seniors can sit right by a community park. That creates social cohesion. And lastly, again, I encourage us to look at Barcelona. A super block creates culture and community cohesion as well. Thank you. I think one of the programs that Seattle has actually done well is My Voice, My Choice which specifically looks at what are the most dangerous intersections and potentially improvements that would increase safety in their neighborhoods. And each neighborhood is allowed, each district is allowed 235,000 in which they basically vote to improve uh, the infrastructure of their communities. I think what's important when we're talking about how do we prioritize what is important as far as safety and walking, it really are the neighborhoods who know their uh, communities the best. And I really would uh, advocate that we in city council be talking to neighborhoods about what makes these intersections dangerous, where people have been killed, and how can we actually improve visibility, walker visibility, and increase people walking in neighborhoods and decrease mortality. Great, right, uh, get out your whiteboards again. We've got another round of lightning questions. Um, First question is, do you support progressive income tax in Seattle? And uh, before you say yes and turn your boards around, um, and what is one other thing that you would do to move Seattle toward a more equitable tax structure? Um, Wiley says yes uh, to income tax and would do impact fees. Shalee Seacrest, yes, income tax over $250,000 at 1.5%. Teresa Mosqueda, yes, capital gains tax, both state and local. And go ahead and keep those, uh, hold, keep those held up so people can see them. John Grant says yes, raise corporate tax rate for affordable housing. And Matt McGregor says yes, plus impact fees, lower small business taxes. Sarah Nelson is right in the novel. It's a while of ours. Sarah says all of the above. Um, in theory, yes, uh, if it's part of comprehensive tax reform. Lower sales tax, lower property tax, and lower B&O taxes for small businesses. All right. Next question. Um, in the space allotted on your whiteboard, so in two or three words, um, 
Define gentrification. Shalee says displacement. John Grant, hand of the market, segregating community, gentrification. Matt McGregor creates barriers to equity. Teresa Mosqueda, community is being pushed out without having voices or priorities considered in new development. Oh man, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hi, Sam says historically. Uh, is it say under desirable? Yeah, undesirable. Undesirable low income neighborhoods uh, becoming high desirable middle income neighborhoods. And Sarah says <laughs> people moving out of an area over time usually has a displacement element because of economic issues and uh, inequality. All right. Um, so we are uh, getting close to wrapping up here. So, um, oh, actually, let's do one more quick lightning round. One. This is a yes or no, so it should just take one second. Um, do you support the sale of the convention place station and the granting of public streets and alleys for uh, expansion of the Washington State Convention Center? Shalee says yes. So one word answer. Oh. <laughs> yes or no? <laughs> Sarah says yes. Matt McGregor says no. Heisen says yes. John says only with public benefits. Yes. Teresa, yes or no? Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, without good job security departments. Yes, but not without good job security departments. All right, um, so uh, just a couple of quick questions. So we're gonna make these 30 second questions since we're, um, since we're running short on time. Um, so uh, what will you do to speed up Sound Transit 3 delivery in Seattle? And we'll start with you. Thanks, since Heisum handed me the mic. What will you do to speed up ST3, stop talking about it and actually implementing it? For a while now, we knew that Seattle was growing exponentially. Um, and we kept talking about policy recommendations. One of my biggest frustrations as a policy analyst and who's actually served on boards with the um, city is that we make great recommendations on what's needed to the urgency of now and then they do a study and it goes nowhere. Um, for ST3, we funded it. It's time that we actually get to moving on it. Let's lay out the plans that we said we were going to do. Um, I think that if we can expedite the permitting process, all the other surrounding cities in the region actually did that to great effect. And I think also if we were to increase the, um, not increase, but bring back the employee hours tax, especially on corporations like Amazon, because they are not paying into the system for, for a transit system that is going to benefit their workers. Yes, we need to speed it up, but I think we get corporate buy-in to help with some of the corporations like Amazon that are bringing all the, all the new tech jobs in. It's going to help them and help the entire city. So I think we do a collaboration with some of these corporations and get them to work with us on that, to speed it up. So I think first and foremost, we need to get community buy-in, work with the community to talk about what we'd like to see. That's critically important for us to be successful. The second thing that we need to do is expedite the permitting process. The city has the control levers over that. We can move forward. The city already passed a resolution to expedite it. Let's move that into action. Third, 
Sound Transit has historically had pretty conservative timelines, and I know they want to be under timeline, but we can push them to do better. I know we can do this faster. And lastly, because federal dollars are not something that we can rely on, we've historically been able to look at programs that come through, for example, the Tiger Grant. We have to work with state partners and county partners more effectively. That's the type of coalition building I've been able to do in the past. Thank you. But besides the permitting process, uh, one could reform NEPA and SEPA and basically categorically exclude transportation services to speed the process up. One could also basically look at noise ordinances and try to find extension either on the front or the back end of things uh, to try to get more time uh, in uh, building transit. Uh, and then the third thing is, but most importantly, is actually make it a real priority where we actually use our bonding capacity to actually push the money forward and pay ourselves back when the tax dollars come in. As much as we all love community input and process, we do have to expedite the community process that will choose alignments and choose the, um, uh, the, the specifics of the, pro of the projects. We need to streamline permitting. We also need to streamline design review or have a completely different design review process for sound transit projects. And we also need to also have agreements with neighboring communities because some of these projects will cross jurisdictional boundaries and so an MOU with, uh, with neighboring communities will help speed that along. All right, um, and now you all have one minute to say anything else that you wanted to say um, and to give your closing statement. And we will, oh, I'm sorry. I bet, yeah, actually, oh. 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 yeah. <laughs> so we'll start, with, we'll start back with John. One minute closing statement, anything else you wanted to say? Just some Go um, so uh, one one minute. So here we go. Um, I think that there's a lot of really important issues that we can tackle as a city together. But one of the most important is the housing crisis. Um, we put forward a proposal that would raise the corporate tax rate to build city-owned, publicly-owned, affordable housing. We put forward a proposal to raise the affordability requirement on developers to 25 percent. We are uh, building a coalition of folks throughout the city and we're funding ourselves with the Democracy Voucher Program. 93% of the $193,000 that we've raised has come from the voucher program. That means that this campaign is owned by the community and we will put the community's interests first and foremost. We need to push back on uh, specula speculation and developers that have too much sway at City Hall. This is the campaign that can make that happen. I ask for your support, I ask you to sign up, and let's make it happen. Thank you. So I think we do a lot of things in Seattle amazingly well, and I think we also have a lot of work to do. As far as civil rights, this to me is the promised land. I came from the South. So I think we do a lot of wonderful things here. We have a big issue with homelessness here that we actually didn't talk about much today. And I think that we're in a crisis mode and we need to do triage right now with the homeless situation we're in. And that means one of the ideas I have is to open up some of our community centers as shelters so that we can get people that want to into shelter immediately and have caseworkers go to those community centers with them and work them through the system so they can get the services they need to get in permanent housing. So that's one of the things I want to look at is how do we address this crisis when we have over 11,000 people that are homeless and we have children sleeping in cars and getting up going to school the next morning. And that is something I think we cannot turn our backs on. I think that's our highest priority. Thank you again for the opportunity to have this forum. I am standing before you as a healthcare justice advocate, an environmental justice advocate, and a worker justice advocate. I have fought to increase the minimum wage, provide healthcare for our kiddos and our families in this city, and create more walkable, bikeable neighborhoods. When I look at what the city does, it has the opportunity to improve people's health, and if not done right, to hurt. We can do a better job in the city of Seattle, a city that prides itself on being progressive, if we work together and address these complicated but solvable issue, issues in our community. I will fight to make sure that more people can afford to live in the city that they work and that more people can afford to retire in the city that they help to build. That is why I am asking for your support. I have the endorsements of people like Bob Ferguson, Pramila Jayapal, um, 
Representative Brady Walkinshaw, people who've seen me in action, people from public health like Patty Hayes, who runs Public Health Seattle King County, and activists and leaders like Rob Johnson, who are showing what it means to work together. If you look at my endorsements, I hope you will see somebody who can work together, be principled, and get things done right now. Thank you. My mother named me Hysom because it means to protect and to serve. I have spent my entire life trying to live up to my name. I went into medicine because I wanted to help the most vulnerable and to give them a voice when the decisions were being made. I have touched homeless patients every day. I dress their wounds. I hold their hands when they are dying. I care very much about what happens to people. Every life has dignity and value. The reason I am running for city council is because I believe everyone in the city deserves a home. A medical, physical, and a cultural home. I am hoping that you will support me in this election and help me live up to my name and help Seattle be the place where every life means something. because we're all progressives here and I think that we all have the same core values but what distinguishes me is the fact that I did work in Councilmember Conlon's office for 10 years on issues ranging from annexation to the environment. I staffed him on the Sound Transit Board. I worked on very a lot of major transportation projects when he was transportation chair. What I can tell you is that this is stuff that is kind of boring but the details matter and so when you hear people say make the developers pay, think about that. We don't want to lose out on the, uh, the housing units that we so very desperately need. It, government is nuanced, and it might, um, what I just want to say is that we need to go forward with um, a balanced perspective, and I have the ability to do that because I have worked in government, and I know that it's a long, slow slog, and a lot of it is not sexy, but it's absolutely necessary, and you need to get the details right to get to the end, end results that you want. Shalise Seacrest, and like you, I'm concerned of the growing inequality in our city. Right now, the top decision makers are for the 1% under this theory that a rising tide will lift all sails. We know that's not the case for those that are aboard the Titanic. So I'm running because I'm here today to ask you to bring a life jacket. Bring a life jacket to a woman who's in a tent. She doesn't have a mental illness. She doesn't have a drug addiction. What she doesn't have is an opportunity. Bring a life jacket for the little boy at Rainier Beach High School. We keep talking about the money we don't have in state funding, and he's depending on us in this room to make sure there's a career path waiting for him upon graduation. Bring a life jacket for the business owner in Ballard, who put everything he owns into his business, and that if he's displaced by our growth, he's got nothing else to fall back on. That's why I'm running, because I've seen the power in this room of coming up with solutions. It's time that we put them to work, right now. That's how come I've been endorsed by Seattle Education Association, the Women's Political Caucus, and other de 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 Democratic districts. Put me to work and I'll get it done. Shelley Seacrest. Read her blog and support her on Patreon. So thank you all again.